Is this supposed to start at five? Is that the deal? All right. I guess we'll get this show on the road. So, hi, welcome to uh, DrupalCon in, uh, where are we, LA. Um, thanks for coming to my session, Demystifying Client Discovery. Um, my name is Greg Dunlap. I can be found as Hayrocker on Twitter and all of the other places on the Internet. Uh, I've been using Drupal for about eight years now. I just passed my eight-year Drupalversary on Drupal.org. Uh, for most of that time, I've been focused on configuration management and deployment stuff in Drupal. At DrupalCon Chicago, Dries asked if I would lead the configuration management initiative for Drupal 8 which I did uh, for a while, and that was pretty exciting. Um, I got to travel lots of places and do lots of this at other Drupal cons. But uh, most recently, for the last couple of years, I've been working as, at Lullabot as an architect. And one of the things that I do as an architect at Lullabot is I get involved with clients in the very early stages of their projects. Um, and I get to go in there and help them determine uh, what kind of a website they want to build and what kind of architecture they need and kind of get to the core of the problems that they're trying to solve and uh, figure out how we're going to solve them. And then uh, we figure that out, and I get to hand it off to the developers who get to do all of the work. Uh, it's a great gig. I highly recommend it. So um, that's what we're here to talk about today is about that discovery process, the process by which you sit down with the clients and figure all that out. Um, I already talked about, I work at Lullabot, this is our logo. We've been around in the Drupal, we were the very first ever Drupal agency, and uh, we work with a lot of really cool clients, uh, like uh, MSNBC. Uh, currently one of my clients that I just started working with is SpaceX. Um, and we've also been doing a lot of work in just the media industry in general, actually. We do a ton of work with, we've worked with Tesla, we've worked with a lot of cool things and launched a lot of cool sites. And I'm really happy to work at Lullabot because we're a great company. So um, at Lullabot, like I said, uh, all of our major projects basically begin with an on-site. We go to the on-site um, with the client, and we sit down with them, and we do what's called discovery. And for me, it's my favorite part of a project because this is where real problems get solved. Ideally, all of the big problems should be solved during this process before you get to actual implementation. I would have thought that Morton was over there or something, but um, apparently they're really getting down next door. So, um, and you know, I'm a, I'm a technology guy, but I've also been involved in technology for a really long time. I'm pushing 25 years building applications. Uh, my first applications were built with Paradox for DOS, which, is, which really ages me. But somebody laughed and they get it. So there's somebody as old as me here. So. Um, and and while I really enjoy technology, I've also kind of gotten over implementation. One of the things I've realized after years of doing client projects is that if the stuff that happens at the beginning d isn't done right, and if those and if the big questions there aren't answered, then the project is is screwed. And so I really like to get in there and solve those big questions and really dig into what the clients need. Um, and one of the reasons that I really that I decided to do this talk is that a lot of technology people like myself get thrown into this process. They say, okay, we've got this big project. Why don't you go out and meet the client and figure out what we're going to do? And, and after years of doing this, I've realized that there's kind of a way that a lot of technologists um, get into it and go about it. And it's a little backwards because the process of discovery is a lot different than the process of actually implementing technology. Um, so let's talk about that. So what's the goal of a discovery process. So a client comes to you and says, I've got this website, and it's kind of beaten down, and it's, it's falling apart after a few years, and there's drug dealers outside, and we, wanna, we, we need, really need to clean it up. We want to spruce it up. What I want is a gorgeous website. I want this nice Victorian with trees and clouds, and, um, and I want you to come in and build it. And what, what a lot of people still do, but which is a mistake, is to throw all their tools on the table and say, all right, let's get to work. Um, 
because you don't want to do that because you don't have an idea of like what they want to build and why. And that's the really important part is you want to know why they want to build things and what they want to do. Client discovery sets the stage for the implementation and lays down the rules that you need to go through to build the website and around which the website's going to be built. Um, and you need to gather some essential information in order to do that, and none of it has to do with servers or modules or RAM. Um, what you really need to know is what are the current client, what are the client's current pain points with their system? Where are things falling apart? What day to day are they are they having trouble executing on? What is the thing that causes them to scream and throw things on a day to day basis? What are their goals out of getting to this? This is related, but it's different. It's like, what do they want to serve their business out of the new site? What are the things that, um, that they want to build? And what are the priorities around that? Because any, anybody can get a group of people in there and talk about what the goals are, but they have to be prioritized. And this is the biggest problem because a lot of times you'll get a bunch of stakeholders in a room and all of them agree about different things that they want to do, but none of them agree about what's most important because they all think that their own thing is most important, right? And solving priorities is where most of the knife fights on these projects happen. Um, getting this information out of them is is incredibly important to making the project. Pri uh, uh, building a website or a web project or any project without priorities is almost impossible. And when we look at Drupal core, this is one of the things that we run into on a day-to-day -day basis, is that we have a bunch of people who come in and they have a bunch of different ways to solve a problem, but, but the product has never had a clear set of goals or priorities laid out. Sometimes Dries will name an initiative lead, or sometimes Dries will do this, but most of the time it's up to us to fight it out and figure out what happens. And that decision-making process is really hampered because we can't say, well, we've got this set of goals and priorities, and we've got this set of potential solutions, so let's figure out which one matches the best, and we'll go with that one. It comes down to a lot of philosophy. It comes down to a lot of potential people saying, this is what I want to do versus what they want to do or object oriented or blah 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 and it's like it's like there's no framework around which to build and make decisions um, so and and just like that in the in a client project it's very important to get that information out of people and that is the most important part of any client discovery process um, you can't build anything without this information uh, this is a quote from an old boss of mine he said, he said, when it comes right down to it, 90% of technical consulting is really business consulting. Um, because a lot of clients, they, they, they know they have a solution in mind, but they don't really know what, what it is or why it is. Most client discovery projects spend about two-thirds of the time collecting all of those pain points, the, um, the, the goals, the priorities, all of that information. And, and a lot of the reason that it takes that long is because there's always a lot of conflict and disagreement within any group, usually when they come in, to um, about what they're going to build and why. And the process of getting it out of them is really the important process of discovery. And it's a process that a lot of like developers and technical people really lack or don't know what to get around. And so there's some tools that are that can help in getting that out. And there are some ways to change your attitude about going into it. Um, which we can talk about here, um, ways to kind of set yourself up for success in the project. I think one of the biggest things is that you want to go in with a blank slate, an empty notebook, as it were. Um, you you want to go in um, with as little information as possible. When I go into these projects, I try and get only the barest information out of people. Um, you know, if they say, well, you know, we've got 20 sites and we want to migrate them to Drupal and five of them are running on WordPress and 10 of them are running on Joomla and two of them are running on a proprietary system that we don't know how to get the information out of. That's like... That's like enough to get started, actually. I don't want to know much more than that before I go into this project. Because if I start asking questions already around that, and usually 
because I'm on the phone with a technical person at this point, there'll be technical questions. I'm already going to start architecting a solution in my mind. And I don't want to do that until I've collected all of the appropriate information, again, about goals and priorities out of the clients. Going in with a technical solution in mind is one of the most common problems that people who walk into these solution, walk into these things have. Um, as an example, we recently had a client who, um, who all of their decisions were driven by their marketing department. It was just like whatever the marketing department wants, they get, and it has to be pixel perfect. I'm sure nobody in this room knows anything about that kind of situation at all. But, um, but because of the situation, because of the business needs and all of the other in, uh, stuff that was going around at this client, this was the way it had to be. And so what they had done is they had built a panel site and and with a bunch of custom panels panes and given the client and given the marketing department the opportunity to put shove whatever custom HTML into it they wanted. That's a solution, all right. But of course the problem that they came up with is that then all of that stuff is tied into their features. And every time the client the marketing people want to change anything, the features have to be rebuilt and pushed out to the live site. Or even worse, if they if the client wants to change things on the live site, uh, then all of those features are out of date and the stuff gets wiped out the next time the developers want to push that stuff out. And so I made a suggestion which was controversial at first, but which works, which was that we could write a little custom panels plugin that does nothing but read from a specified HTML file off of the disk. And we give marketing access to that HTML file and they can do whatever the hell that they want, but it's decoupled from their panels. And then everybody can, they can push their stuff live and we can push our stuff live and everything's separate. From an architectural and technical standpoint, it's a ridiculous solution. <laughs> I mean, it's, we're talking about like 1995 CMS technology at that point. But on the other hand, when you look at the, when you look at the client's goals and their pain points, and their priorities, it was exactly the right solution because it's not really up to us to judge what the client's goals and pain points are. They're, we are here to serve them and they're here to tell us what they need. Um, and so from that perspective, it was a great solution. They still didn't do it because their tech people thought it was ridiculous, but I did my part. Another, I mean, another example of that is that um, one of our clients came to us and he was overwhelmed and he had a very hard deadline that he had to hit because of the school launching for the next semester. Hard deadlines are of course the, the you know, most common problem that we, that we struggle with as technologists uh, a lot of the times. Um, and, and we had to talk through how he was going to get this done because he was also a very smart and adept and forward thinking web developer and he wanted to do everything really right. And that was going to be a problem on the three to four month deadline that he had to launch by the next semester. And one of the things that I had to do over time was talk him through that and how we were going to get through things and talk about descoping, not just descoping and feature descoping, but also about how he could build it forward thinking and, and attack these problems after launch. Because again, I knew from talking to him that his priorities were that deadline. He had to hit that deadline. And so anything we had to do to make that work was what it was up to us, even though he didn't get to do a lot of the things that I, as a technologist, would have loved to help him do on the project. Empathy is a big part of being a client, of being a consultant and a technologist, um, because you have to understand where they're coming from. Another important thing is that you want to make sure that when you're talking about these solutions, you have all of the right people in the room. Obviously, you want their technology staff and their design staff in the room um, because they're the people who have all of the information that you need to be able to build. Um, another, uh, did that come up? Wrong button. Business owners are important too, though, because they're the ones who understand the perspective of the business side of it versus the technology side. They're the ones who are often the decision makers. This can come in a lot of different forms and realms depending on the client that you're working with. But if all you've got is tech people and designers in the room, I can guarantee that you don't have all of the people that you need in order to d discover what this client's goals and priorities are. 
Um, another really important thing that gets kind of lost in the shuffle on a lot of these projects is the editorial team. Um, and part of the reason that it gets lost in the shuffle is because a lot of, in a lot of these organizations, those are just sort of the people who do the work every day. They don't have a lot of representation in the leadership of the business. But on the other hand, they're the ones who do the work every day. They're the ones who have to struggle with the CMS every day, and they're the ones who probably know better than anyone on the leadership what the pain points and time-consuming parts of doing the work on the day-to-day -day basis is. Having the editorial team and or a leader from the editorial team in place is so important to making these projects work. And, and having them in place at the beginning is so important because they're the ones who understand that if the, if the project is not built properly, then nobody's going to want to use it. A classic example of that is... Uh, image sharing. So everybody wants like, oh yeah, we want to be able to take this one image and use it everywhere on the site. That's great. Um, so you build an image library and it's basically at that point you're building a digital management system. And then they're like, oh, we've got so many images we can't find anything. And so you add all of this tagging and categorization and stuff like that. But then it means that anytime anybody adds an image to the site, they've got to fill out like 15 fields so they can find the image. And you know, it's like the kind of thing that everybody thinks, oh, it'd be great if we had this image library and all of these tags and blah, blah, blah. But they don't think about the fact that if nobody uses uses it, it's useless. And it's not only useless, it's you're in a worse situation than you were before, where you could just upload an image and use it. And maybe, you know, once in a while you'd have to find the image in four places and replace it. These are the kind of conversations that we have a lot with clients. Um, another classic one is automation versus curation of content because everybody wants to say, oh, I want every list of content on our site to be completely curated until they pass it down to the editorial staff who barely have time to enter the, the content that they enter on a day-to-day -day basis, much less manage uh, 150 lists of how that content is, is brought forth and things like that. Um, thinking about that and getting the editorial staff involved in the discovery process is super, super important. And uh, a lot of times it really, it, it's really key to the success or failure of things. Here's another quote from my colleague Jeff Eaton. Uh, Successful consulting has as much in common with therapy as it does with technology. It's not entirely accurate, but there's, there's definitely a grain of truth at it because having everyone in the room is just part of the problem. But getting, but getting at the why of the project that you're building with everybody in the room is, is another part of the problem. And that's really a people problem, much more than a technology problem. Um, and, and, you know, drawing this stuff out of them has a lot of things in common with the counseling and therapy and stuff like that. Um, here are some discovery techniques that I've used. They work for me and they work for my personality. Um, they may not work for other people, but perhaps they'll give you some ideas of how we can pull information out of our clients and how we can make these groups of people work. One seems recently obvious, you wanna ask a lot of questions. For me, one of the best parts of being a consultant and working with a lot of clients is that I really love learning about people's businesses. Excuse me. Um, the vagaries of how people's businesses work and the different ways in which people work together is endlessly fascinating to me. How people make money, how their bu what their business models are in the end, what their structures are in terms of how they work together. I love all of this stuff. And so when I'm in a, when I'm in a discovery process, and again, if you've gone in without really any preconceptions in mind, I'm just asking questions about anything just because I just think it's cool to learn about how people work together. Um, and so, and, and I don't like draw lines. I'll just like ask all sorts of weird stuff all the time. And it's like, I was recently working with the American Booksellers Association and they're a trade organization. I spent a lot of time talking with them just about how they're funded. And they came, they talked about this really fascinating stuff about how, you know, about where their money comes from and how and how they serve their um, and how they serve their bookstores and this led into a really inf interesting discussion about um, the relationship of bookstores to publishers and all of this sort of stuff. It was really really cool, um, but a lot of it just came just because I started talking with them, not about the project or anything, just about who they are and what they do, um, and 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 that's one way because a lot of people love talking about their own business. They love talking about the places where they work. So just asking questions 
questions can bring them out um, of a lot of that information. This is an interesting one. Uh, don't break the awkward silences. Um, one of the things that um, that therapists use, and I think this is really what uh, Eaton was talking about when he told me that client consulting is like therapy, is that a lot of times you'll talk and you'll talk and you'll talk and you get to a place where everyone's just staring at each other. Just let them do it. <laughs> Eventually, somebody's going to break the silence, and it really shouldn't be you um, because the person who breaks the silence may be the person who proposes a solution, who comes out with the core of what the problem that caused the awkward silence is, who is going to bring up the thing that's really behind the scenes of all of this. Um, let, them, let them hash it out. Just stand back and let them go. Um, you can ask lots of questions, but on the other hand, you've got to know when to stand back and let them talk it out, too. Um, again, a lot of times in these projects, we come together um, and, and we get a lot of people in who have conflicting views about what the end goals and priorities should be. And sometimes you can direct them and sometimes you can just let them go at it and figure it out because a lot of times they might not even realize that the things that they have together are in conflict or that somebody else had the specific goals that were different than them. You need to let them sort of talk that stuff out and figure it out and, um, and sort it out. Facing politics head on, this can be tough. A lot of situations obviously are very political. A lot of times, you know, you may be at a company that has all sorts of other business stuff going on behind the scenes that you don't know about. But when you see that stuff, you really need to get at the core of the reality of it. Um, obviously, the reality of it can be different depending on who you're talking to. And um, the, the, some of these things can be sensitive and stuff like that. But on the other hand, sitting around and pretending that none of this exists, that this guy doesn't hate this guy because, you know, he stole this guy from over here and stuff like that, it doesn't help, you know. Um, sitting around and pretending that all of these people uh, are really in it together when they're not, which is another thing that we'll talk about a little later, um, doesn't, doesn't help anybody at all. Um, being honest with everybody is really important. And at Lullabot, one of the things that we, are really, um, that we are really focused on is just being straightforward and honest with our clients. And one of the things that's really amazing that comes out of that is that they end up being straightforward and honest with us in a way that's really rare, actually, in a client and consultant relationship. So, um, obviously, there's ways to handle this more and gently, but ignoring the politics behind the project that you're on isn't really going to help anybody. There's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different um, sort of philosophies about note taking. Um, I was noticing me and Eaton were actually on a project just recently, and I noticed that he was furiously taking notes in Evernote and mind mapping and doing all of this, and I had a notebook out and. I, I think I took up two pages of notes. I think I think three of them were just quotes that I found interesting on the client's website. And one was an idea for a presentation that came out of the talk that we were having. It's like it was stuff that was like interesting to me that came out of the things that we were talking about. It didn't really have anything to do with the project itself. Um, I would say that I don't focus on taking down every little detail because, again, I'm very big picture oriented when I go into these things. But maybe you like taking down every little detail because it means that later you can start pulling them together and trying to see where the pieces fit together or what commonalities different things have. I tend to just like let it all flow in and let it sit in the back of my brain over a couple of days and let the pathways kind of find themselves for the eureka moment that makes me understand what's going on here or the pieces that form big themes that I wouldn't have really thought about, I think, if I had just like started writing. That's one of those things that works for me. It may not work for everybody. But having some way to get down the things that are interesting or important to you is important. Again, you may use the computer. I like to write so that I can have my computer free to look at other things and stuff like that. And I find that my brain responds differently to writing than it does to typing. Whatever, you know, what works for you is important. Um, but having a record of what's important to you is also important. Don't problem solve. It, it's so easy for us as technologists when we find, uh, and I assume, I didn't even ask, I assume most of the people involved in here are involved in building websites on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> is that correct? Um, I did get into the coding track after all. Um, it's really easy for us as technology people to problem solve because, again, we hear, we hear a problem and we start thinking of solutions and then we want to get into it because we're excited because we're excited to potentially have solutions. But, again, 
problem solving before you have everything out. And a lot of times, like, the core problems may not even come out until the second day of a discovery thing is really dangerous. And so, again, I try and just let the process go as long as I can, just talking, just figuring out who they are and what they are, and, and, um, and getting at the core of, again, goals and priorities, because coming out with that is really important. And like I said, um, let, I, I always let the big picture find itself. Uh, it, it's always, it, it seems like really scary every time I go into one of these projects. So maybe this is going to be the time where I go through three days and suddenly I'm nowhere. I've got nothing left than anything that I, than I, than I did when I started. But, but it's really interesting because a lot, of, a lot of clients, they themselves get so involved in their day-to-day -day stuff that the big themes that drive them, they don't even really realize. And you, sitting back, watching them discuss this day-to-day -day stuff, can pull that stuff out a lot easier than, you, than they can because you're much more separated from it. Let the big picture find itself, and then we can drive into problem solving later. That said, there are a few technical things that are really important to get out of every discovery project. Um, and they're the kind of things that really, really do impact things like server configuration and server architecture and stuff that you need to get right right at the beginning in order for everything else to, to move on from. These are things like content sharing. Let's say they come in and, and, uh, and they say, we've got 20 websites and we need to be able to display one story from one website on any of the other websites. That's the kind of thing where it's like, well, are you going to go for a domain access? Are you going to go for multi-site? Are you just going to feed RSS feeds everywhere? Getting to the core of those kinds of questions is super important because, because they're the kind of stuff that you need to know before you can even start a single line of code. What their third-party integrations are is really important. Having a list of that stuff, again, it gives you a big picture view of it from the technology side that you need to have before you move on. Um, SSO, LDAP stuff, permissioning stuff, who can have access to what. Again, I don't dive too deep, but I want to know what their framework for that stuff is in their current organization and whether we're going to have to integrate with it at all. Um, these are the kinds of things that have to be done before project build can even begin at all. And while there aren't many of these purely technical things, I do want to get out of the room with these guys be, um, having them in hand before, before we go anywhere else. Sometimes um, there are some red flags that you can have um, before be or as you're just getting involved in a discovery project and um, spotting them early and figuring out how to deal with them is pretty important because otherwise, um, I mean, the best case scenario of not spotting one of these and getting into a really sticky situation is that uh, you end up with a website that has nothing but carousels on the front page. Um, again, I don't know how many times I can quote Eaton in one talk, but um, Eaton's great quote about carousels is that they're always the result of the world's worst knife fight in a meeting, and everybody just gives up and says, fine, we'll just put everything up there. Um, but, you know, in the worst case, this can, this can be the kind of stuff that really causes a project to fall apart in the end. Um, I think the classic and most, uh, most um, important example is the invisible stakeholder. They're the person that everybody talks about but isn't there. Um, they say, you know, oh, yeah, we're going to have to talk to George about that. Or, oh, yeah, Mary has that information. We'll get back to you on that. And, you know, their name is constantly coming up as somebody who has to be pulled into the discussions, but they're not there. That's bad. Um, you're in a situation where there's obviously somebody who's important enough that they're always on everybody's minds. But if they're not there, then the whole core of what you're after here is going to be extremely difficult to get to the center of. Um, handling this can, can be up to trying to get them in, trying to get into contact with them about the questions that you're having while the project is still going at least, figuring out at least who they are and what their role is so that you can kind of surround the problem from all angles and understand what pieces are missing. Um, but identifying that that person exists is really, really important to know about so that you can start managing it. Um, antagonistic political situations are hard to deal with. Um, they're even harder to deal with when you start truly empathizing with one side and not the other. 
it happens. It's tough. I've done it. Um, but um, getting 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 to a place where there's at least one common goal between all of these people or one thing that they can agree on is super important. It's a lot of work. And a lot of times it's work that you don't even have the ability to solve. And spotting somebody in the team who seems like who seems like they have a, a measure of respect from the sides involved can be really helpful because you can pull them aside and say, hey, we really need to solve this. Can you help me get through with these people? Or can you pull them together and try and get them uh, on the same page at least to some extent? Because this project isn't going to work if, uh, if all these people are fighting every decision that we have to make every step of the way. Um, uh, there are different techniques for handling it, but it's usually pretty easy to spot early on. And again, if you spot it early on, then you can start thinking about it as you start going through the process and thinking about it as uh, ways to handle it. And just realizing that it's there and building stuff around it can be really important. Um, some clients are come in the same way that you do. They are, um, you may have a very highly technical team that's running this on that side, but but all they want to dive into are the server questions and how much RAM they need. I actually had a client like this recently um, where he was the director of technology and he really wanted to dive into all of the architectural questions very deeply without involving the rest of his team. And I kept talking to him and they were in a situation where they had a lot of shared content and a lot of different sites that they were trying to integrate in a sort of separate but equal way. Um, and I, I, I had to keep coming back to him saying, we have a lot of questions that we haven't answered yet. Can we bring uh, some of these other people in to discuss them and sort them out? And he would, he would say, oh, yeah, sure. And then the next day, we'd be back to diagramming his network architecture. Um, that, that can be a problem just as it is with us diving too deeply into the weeds early on with a client that's diving too deeply in the weeds early on. I wish I had spotted that in this client way earlier in our process, and then I could have redirected it a lot better. Um, for instance, when I had the client with an onset with that client and I was able to meet with his other groups, I could have I could have reached out to them, gotten more contact information, gotten closer with them so that I had other places that I could reach out to rather than this one person. Um, and that was, you know, that was one of those things that I had to fight with um, later on in a project because I didn't see it. But, you know, ultimately, what, again, what we're talking about here is, is that you need to realize that the client discovery process is, is, a is a people problem. You've got a technology project. You're building a piece of technology. But getting to the point where you know what and why you want to build is totally a people problem. And even just going into your discovery with that in your mind is, is going to help you immensely. Because if you do that and come out of it um, with all of the information you need, then you can hand that off to your developers. And if they have that, then they can go and make the decisions about technology, even the stuff that you haven't had to do really well. Uh, when we did the American Booksellers Association project, I did all of the discovery and, and helped them through a lot of the decision making that led to an architecture for the build that we were doing and the migration. And Dave Reed did that migration. Um, and as he was doing that migration, he was saying, hey, you know, based on all of the stuff that you've given me and about what they want to do and why and when and stuff, I think this technology, this over here that I know a lot about that you didn't know anything about would be a really good fit for them. And we talked it through, and he was totally right. But he could not have made that decision if I hadn't brought to him all of the information that he needed to know about why and what this project was and what its goals and priorities were. Um, and that stuff, that's the stuff that drives all of our projects. It's so important to get done. If you get it out together, then we can all have a big high five at the end, and everyone will have a lot of success, and we'll party, and then you can come to DrupalCon and talk about how cool your project was. Um, so that's uh, my presentation, and I'll be happy to take any questions from anybody if they have them. How do you know when uh, the discovery process is, is done? Is there a finish? Um, we typically um, do, don't do much more than three days for these. Sometimes we'll do two, um, but usually our discoveries are three days. I found that it's usually, um, it's usually a good amount of time. I, I would actually say that sometimes or even reasonably often 
about into the early or middle second day, um, we will probably have the information that we need. And I'll say that's a gut feeling more than anything. Um, but again, if I'm starting to see the trends, if I'm starting to see the big picture, and if I'm repeating it back to them and they're nodding their heads and they're saying, yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me, or, you know, based on what you all are saying, I see you, you know, it seems like a lot of your focus is here, you know, is that really important to this project? Um, and then, you know, if we have some time left, we actually will start diving into what we're going to do. Um, but, but, you know, having, having the time to make sure that you can get there is the important part. Um, but how do you know you're done? Uh, you just kind of know. <laughs> sure. Oh, so he's asking about paid discovery versus unpaid discovery. We only do paid discovery. And um, especially um, our, 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 the classic way that we'll do this is that we will – um, come to a client and they'll have, you know, something on the order of maybe not much more than we have 20 sites and we want to migrate them to Drupal and here's what platforms they're on right now and maybe here's what traffic they're on. And then maybe I'll get an hour with them in the sales process and ask them a few more questions. And what we will usually do is pitch them the discovery as an individual project. And then out of that discovery, we'll come up with the information that they can take to another place to build if they want to. But we get paid for the discovery. It is an invoiced project. And, but what we found actually is that usually we can establish a really good rapport with the client and we will end up getting the build as well if we want it. And, and you know, obviously at that point the client is is motivated to work with us because we've gone, we understand their business and everything that they're going through and things like that. I'm not a fan of the unpaid discovery. Yes. Two questions. Uh, first one, do you have any techniques for flesh or, or kind of pulling out those goals from, from the organization that you're working with? I mean, one of the, one of the things is that um, all of the groups have their own goals, and getting those out first is, is a starting point. Um, finding commonalities there starts to build the big picture. Um, a lot of times there you'll start talking about <coughs> – excuse me – You'll start talking to groups about what their goals or what happens in their group or what their business things are, and you'll see certain themes develop that maybe they hadn't articulated as goals or hadn't thought about as goals, but which really are goals for them as an organization, but which they in their own little pockets hadn't figured out. And that's when you start bringing that stuff up back to them, saying, you know, I noticed that you all mentioned, you know, this kind of thing is a problem. Um, and if they start nodding their heads and like, wow, you're right, and then you start writing that down. Or, um, you know, it seems like you all think this is really important or like this is oh, – you all seem to think that this class of problem is a real bummer. And they'll be like, yeah, you're right, you're right. And um, that's where you can start – that's where your value really comes in because you've got the 5,000-foot view and they've got the, you know, 10-foot view. And, um, and starting to pull all of that stuff together from high up is really um, key to what you're trying to do as part of that process, I think. And, and secondly, a after you're done this discovery process, like what have, have you created? Like do you have a list of – 200 user stories or like what what if what have you got to pass on to the next phase usually what um we'll have to pass on is um you know we'll have a document it'll be about 15 pages it'll um a lot of it will be summary of uh, of what we discussed it'll be um our big, big picture view of the project um, it will have um, a lot of architecture stuff involved in it because, again, after we get involved with – after we get all of this goals and priorities in place, I will take it and say, well, based on what they've told me, here is how I recommend that we build out this project. Um, and we usually have enough information to pull timelines and budgets together as well. So I might say, based on the information that you've given me, I recommend that you um, – that you build, um, you know, each of these sites individually with a content store on solar that they all have an API to access so that you can do federated search. And then through this content store, they can also pull out in, they can also pull out stories from each of the individual sites because the business has deemed that it's important that while each site maintain their own identity, they should be able to 
prioritize or bubble up stuff from the other sites that they wanted. Um, you know, stuff like that, the stuff that, that um, feeds from their priorities and goals, but we have to talk about how to build it um, in, a, in a sustainable way. Um, we'll, we will often get into what modules will you use? What version of Drupal will you use? That's going to be a question that's going to start being a big one soon. It's already people are starting to ask. Would you recommend that we do this now or would you recommend that we do it later? Well, it depends. How much do you need um, a solid web services foundation? How much do you need to get it done by the end of the year? You know, all of these things feed into it. And we'll have that document, and it'll basically be, you know, here's what we've learned from you. Here's what we determined that you want and need. Here's how we would recommend that you would build it. If you want us to do it, then here is how much time it would take and what it would cost, basically, is what we come out of it with. So at that high of a level, like, you're able to come up with a budget with any great certainty? With a reasonable amount of certainty, yeah, I would say so. All right. Thanks. Okay. You mentioned um, kind of dealing with pol the political questions head on. You know, yeah. That, that works pretty well, especially if you're an outside consultant. I'm yes, that's right. Do you um, have any perspective for insiders who are, you know, basically doing the in-house discovery? Oh, that's hard. It's really hard. You know, Actually, so it's not the CTO's pet project, that kind of thing. Right, and it's tough because um, I was actually brought in on a project recently for just that reason where um, the um, – the, the the CTO was dealing with a lot of rabble rousing within his organization and within his board of directors about topic X. And um, he didn't think that topic X was a good idea or he thought they should consider Y or whatever. And would you come in and help us do an analysis of our business and our situation and say, A, what kind of stuff would you recommend to us, but also specifically talk about topic X, Y, and Z. And it was interesting because when I presented that to their board, they said, you know, this was stuff that had been sacrosanct for their board to discuss, that they had just said no to 100% every time it came up. But as soon as it came out of my mouth, they're sitting there talking about it. And so you're right. As a third-party consultant, we, we have a lot of ways to dive through and cut through that stuff that you internally don't. Um, and I don't have a good answer for you. I'm sorry. Maybe, maybe it's just convince them to bring in the third party. Bring in a third-party person. And actually, sometimes, you know, Sometimes you can use that person's confidence against them because if they really are that confident, then why wouldn't they want to bring in a third party? Why wouldn't they want to bring in an expert to talk about it, to confirm them? Because then they've got this platform on which they can shove everything through, right? But on the other hand, a lot of times they actually know what the real deal is too. So that doesn't help you either. Um, I, don't, I don't have a lot of good perspectives for you. I'm sorry. All right. No problem. Thanks. <laughs> I'm also very internal, um, mm -hmm. so I get a lot of pushback. If we have a consultant and the consultant says we're going to do a discovery process, then everybody's really happy about it and they participate fully. But if I'm walking into the room, I say, okay, first couple of days we're going to do a discovery process on this new project, um, there's a resistance to it. It's like, oh, it's a waste of time. We already know what the goals are. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sort of tips and tricks for pitching this? to get people to buy into the process? Well, I mean, let's say they say to you, oh, I are, we already know what the goals are. So ask them, what are the goals? And get a list. And then go to all of the other people involved and say, hey, it's my understanding that the goals for this project are X, Y, and Z, and that's what I've been told by this group over here that's building it. Um, is that right? And you're, from the implication that I'm getting is that it's probably not. Now you've got a reason to say, oh, wow, that's weird. That's what they told me. Maybe we should all get together and talk about it. It probably won't ingratiate you with the group over here that thought that they were going to that, – that thought that they knew that they were doing. But on the other hand, it's probably going to ingratiate you with these groups over here that are like, wow, I'm really glad that this group over here didn't dive into a black hole and, and try and do that thing. Um, that's probably, you know, one thing that you could do. But I understand, again, internally, your politics are a lot different than mine are because I can say whatever I want to and walk away. Um, and not whatever I want to. I can say whatever I want to and get fired, too, of course. But, um, but, but those, those, those dynamics are, in, are, are uh, infinitely more complex than the ones that I have. And uh, a lot of times it will really depend on your own situation and navigating that. Uh, a lot more carefully than I can probably sit here and talk about. 
Does anybody else have any questions? Somebody else seems to be going up there. Do you guys have a predefined agenda for your discovery process? So you said three days. Do you give an agenda to the client? We usually try. We usually do a pretty loose agenda, sort of about you know the first ha the first the first quarter of the day. We'll do introductions and who are you and what is your role in the project, and then we'll dive into you know the topics will depend greatly on the project that's involved, um, but maybe it'll be a inventory of the sites that they have or a um, let's let's um, let's you know, why don't you take me through your site and let's look at what's there. That can actually be really helpful because a lot of times they'll be like, oh, and so here's this page and God, I hate this thing over here. It drives me crazy. Or here's this page that has this bug that we've never been able to fix and, and it's really horrible. Um, you'll get a lot of insight into their pain points just naturally because everybody loves complaining about their existing website, especially when they're going to build a brand new one. So, um, and a lot of that stuff will end up feeding questions that, again, now we start driving into the into the into the uh, stuff that we're really there for. The agenda tends to be sort of really really big topics that we may or may not get to. But the one thing that's really useful in the agenda is you can say, "Here's this really big topic, and for this really big topic, it's really important for these people to be here." Um, because you know, when you're talking about the things like um, what kind of content are we going to share? That's a different big problem than what, uh, what I, I've heard you guys are using, want to have an SSO solution. What do you have in place right now um, where you're going to need to get the, the system admin guys in there? Um, it, and it also helps because it means that uh, you don't have to say, you know, a lot of these stakeholders are usually really busy and very appreciative of the chance to say, oh, I can take two hours away from this and go catch up on, on the rest of my life. Um, that, so that is one part that's really good about having an agenda. But again, the agenda tends to be very broad and very generalized. Um, we don't dive into it too deeply. Hello. Hi. So you talked a little, quite a bit about goals and defining goals across yeah. the organization and across different stakeholders. How do you incorporate kind of like the the end user goals into that process? So the people who will actually be using the site and mm -hmm. maybe not your client. Ideally, those goals are built into their goals. It's not always true. I always like to joke that I've never seen a user study in which the users came out and said, God, I really wish I could have more tar more advertising that was targeted at me more closely. Um, so, you know, obviously sometimes those things aren't in opposition, but they are different. Ideally, they will be bringing those things up. And there's a lot of those goals that we end up bringing up to them, especially now with things like responsive, with front-end work, with front-end performance, um, where, you know, that'll come out of our research either before or during. Um, but, you know, a lot of times it'll be like, you know, is this important to you? And they'll say, you know, oh, no, responsive is not important to us. Only 5% of our thing is mobile. And then we'll say, have you ever considered the fact that maybe the reason 5% of your thing is mobile is because when you bring it up on your website, all you can see is this little logo in the corner, and then you have to scroll and screen everything down, right? Um, we've, we've, we have a lot of those discussions, although they're becoming rarer and rarer as time goes on, obviously. Um, but... Um, if they don't bring them up, I will usually bring them up as a matter of course. Um, but again, you can't always control those priorities. And at some level, if if they haven't determined that that stuff is their priority right now, then it's kind of out of your hands. Yeah, I guess, do you ever push for a component of like customer research to try to bring that into the conversation? We definitely have. It's usually for clients that are to some some it, it depends on what point in the process you come through like a lot of our projects they may already have wireframes and designs in place mm -hmm. if that happens then there's not a lot of help we can do about things like consumer re customer research if we come in really early like right at the very beginning and we're starting to build that part of our business a lot more now especially as we repeat with clients because they come back to us and say, you did a great job doing the build out for our website, and we're just starting to think about our next website. Mm -hmm. and then we start talking about that kind of stuff a lot. User research, um, all sorts of like content strategy stuff and responsive, and um, stuff that'll help establish those goals, again, 
earlier in the process, as early as humanly possible. But sometimes we just don't have that opportunity because we're just brought in to do the build. Cool. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So after you've um, built up this working body of knowledge around the business operations, how do you transfer that to the development team, you know, after the solutions architect engagement as a, you know, discovery? Right. Usually um, we will – they will have, of course, access to the document that we wrote. But usually the, the person who does the architecture will, at least to some extent, continue to be involved through the life of the project. We've talked about different ways in which that can um, reveal itself. Um, there are certain architects who are interested in actually taking the project and becoming the PM going forward. That has a lot of advantages in a lot of ways if they're, you know, if they're the kind of person who is good or interested in doing that. Um, it maintains an existing relationship with somebody, some continuity between the people that they're working with for the client, which is obviously helpful for them. And you've got the body of knowledge that you can pass on to the developers, especially if you yourself are a developer in the past and we only hire technical PMs. We don't hire projects managers who have never had any development experience before for the most part so um, because because of that very thing so they can communicate with the developers um, but even if the person is just tasked with you know a once a week meeting where they get together and say hey do you guys have any questions for me and they say no or yes you know this part of what we've been doing doesn't make any sense or you know I noticed this part is missing did you mean to fill something in there that you never got around to or you know these two things were in opposition uh, maybe was that something that got resolved later on or things like that um, but uh, maintaining some level of presence in the project is important for us and we always do it we never just throw it over the wall and then walk away sure. Do you ever see yourself involved in uh, requirements engineering or becoming more of a technical product owner as the project is uh, moves forward? You mean in terms of um, translating some of that business value towards the uh, project and implementation? We usually do that as part of the project, as part of what we deliver in the deliverable after the discovery. We do right. talk a lot about um, implementation. We talk about versions that we that we'd recommend. Um, one of the things that we talk a lot about with clients right now is whether decoupled makes sense for them or not, um, depending again on their goals and what kind of staff they have and what kind of stuff that they're trying to put together. Um, we don't we don't obviously get down into we're going to install these modules and you're going to have five views on this page, but general um, concepts of their architecture and general big picture stuff will definitely get into as a part of the um, as a part of the uh, requirements document that we build how deeply we get into the implementation once the dev build starts depends wildly on the project and staffing and who's involved in the project over here and who is involved in the project over here and stuff like that one of the things that's great about lullabot is that we don't have a rigid established process we tend to be very fluid depending on the client and their needs and so in a lot of those cases um, we'll just see how it how it plays out to be honest sure thank you yep and uh, thanks everyone for coming I hope that this was useful to you all and um, if you like this session or any, or dislike this session or any other session that you attended uh, this week, please go to the evaluation URL um, and, uh, and rate the session and leave comments. As somebody who has previously organized DrupalCon and been a track chair for DrupalCon, I cannot emphasize how much these evaluations are helpful to us in determining um, choices for speakers in the following years. Um, this stuff is really informative and really helpful both for our speakers and to the organizers. Thanks. I'll upload my sides, look on Twitter, I'll post it. Do they have a place on the session you on the session notes to upload slides on the on the uh for the uh for the con? They usually do lately. They'll be out there.